This is Michelle Jorgensen with Mount Mahogany Steak Self-Reliance. Today I'm going to talk to you about something that I love. I love gardening. And even though by the end of the season I'm actually ready for my garden to probably be done so I can quit weeding it, by November, December I'm really excited for that garden to get going again, but I can't start yet. But we can start if we start seeds indoors. And something starts happening about December, January. I start to get these beautiful seed catalogs in the mail and I start dreaming about it again. So that's what we're going to talk about is how do we start seeds indoors? The first question you might have is why? Why would you want to start a seed indoor? Well, there's a few different reasons. The first is that some of the seeds that we grow, like tomatoes, like peppers, eggplant, some of those things can't actually grow from seed in your garden all the way to harvest during one growing season. So if I plant a tomato seed in the ground, it's not going to give me tomatoes by the end, by the time that everything freezes and that tomato plant no longer keeps growing. So usually wherever, where I live in Utah here, I have to buy those plants from a nursery. Now that costs a lot of money. Um, seedlings are quite expensive and I figured out one year I saved myself probably $300 in growing my own seedlings. So that's a really good reason to grow your own seedlings. Another one is variety. Again, the seed catalog is full of the most beautiful varieties of things. Um, when I look in the, the tomato section, there are so many different tomatoes here. There's a whole section of yellow tomatoes, of purple tomatoes, of green tomatoes. These are tomatoes you're never going to find in a nursery. They grow a few varieties, the most hardiest kind, but that's it. So if you want variety, if you want to be able to save some money, and if you want to get a jump on the season, a great thing to do is to start your own seeds. Now a lot of people are really scared off by this. They think, oh, this is so hard, it's so time consuming. So I want to really debunk a lot of those myths today and tell you it's really not that hard and it's really not that time consuming. There's a few things you do need to know though. So first of all, let's talk about supplies. You do need some growing cells. These are called cells. They are cheap. I just looked on Amazon today and for like a thousand of them, you can get them for $20. So these are very, very inexpensive. Um, you can buy new ones each year if you'd like. You can also reuse old ones. And a lot of times I will reuse my old ones. I'll just save them as I plant them out each year and reuse them. One concern or caution with that is if you have any soil-borne organisms, um, fungus or anything in this soil that, that remains on the cells, it may transfer to your newly started, newly spreading plants. So one trick I do is I stick all these things out in my greenhouse that gets really hot and I like to think that that kind of bakes everything out and kills it all off during that uh, really hot time during, in the greenhouse. Um, but if you just want to be safe, just buy some new ones. Like I said, they're not very expensive. You also are going to need a tray. Now you need a tray that's a solid bottom tray. So that means this kind that has no holes in the bottom. I brought out another kind just so you can see the kind you don't want to have because a lot of these things you can actually get from the nursery from last year that you bought seedlings. You don't want this kind. This kind isn't going to be helpful for you. You want the kind that's solid bottom. So you want a tray. You want a cover on that tray. This is a clear cover. I reuse these every single year. You just want a clear cover that will fit on top of that tray. You want some labels. Believe me, this is uh, from past history. I've used all sorts of things. I've cut up old plastic containers and things to use as labels. Again, these are cheap for about a thousand of them for $10. Just get yourself a bag of labels. Um, you want to make sure that you write with Sharpie on there. Again, this is from Sad Experience as all of the labels washed off and I had no clue what I planted where. So make sure you use a, a waterproof marker on that. And then you need some seeds. Now I love both of these seed catalogs. This one's called uh, Baker Creek Baker Creek Seeds, and this one's called Johnny Select Seeds. These are just two of my favorites. One of the reasons that they're my favorite is because, well, especially Baker Creek grows all, all non-hybrid seeds, which means I can actually save seed from any of the plants that I planted last year, and I'll be able to plant them this year, and they'll grow. If you plant a hybrid seed, it's actually a sterile seed, and you're not gonna be able to save that seed. Well, if you're talking about self-reliance, you wanna be able to save the seed. If you have that tomato plant from last year, you can actually, it's called fermenting. There's a special way you do it to save seed, and I think we'll do that at the end of the year. I'll talk about that. But you can save that seed, and one tomato can grow 50 more tomato plants the following year. So you really want to grow those open pollinated or heirloom seeds and not hybrids so that you can keep growing every single year, and then you don't have to grow seeds every year. Um, so those are pretty much all you need, that along with some soil. Now, I went to the nursery that I typically buy seedlings from and I just asked them what they grow and asked if I could buy a bag of it. It was $20 for a great big huge three cu cubic foot bag that I'll never use in a year. And um, 
this is the kind of soil they use, so I thought that's probably pretty good soil. You can find recipes for it online, actually, if you look on the website, which is www.mmsteakselfreliance.com. Uh, I put actually a recipe on there, so you can make your own if you'd like, but for me, $20 at the nursery was easier than going to find all the different ingredients and making my own. So that's the only supplies you need. Now we're going to talk about how. So if you're planting a seed, we're going to actually do that. I filled a couple of cells here with some soil, and we're going to plant a, an orange pepper called a horizon pepper today. A couple of the things to know when you're planting these seeds is, first of all, the planting depth. How deep do you plant them? Well, if you can see, you probably can't see, this pepper seed's a tiny little seed. The rule on planting seeds is you go three times the width of the seed is the depth. So if you think this is a very tiny little seed, I'm barely going to set it even in the soil. In fact, a lot of times with tiny seeds, what I do is I put it in the soil and then I just sprinkle a tiny bit over top. You don't want that seed to have to work very hard to emerge, so you don't want to plant it very deep. You just, I don't push it down, I just let me put a little bit of soil over top and that's all I do. Then I immediately put my plant tag in there, and I usually prepare these ahead of time so I have them all ready. I put my plant tag in there because now I know that is where a horizon pepper is planted. However, I did something wrong. I always plant two. I always plant two seeds in one cell, and that's just a little bit of insurance, especially pepper seeds aren't actually very good at germinating. Sometimes they're very difficult to germinate. So I'll plant two and even three pepper seeds in one cell just to make sure that I make sure that I get a pepper plant out of that. Uh, some seeds are very good at germinating, but I usually rule of thumb is that I always plant two. Um, watering. Now, when I water, that's why you need this solid tray, because what I'm going to do is I'm going to just pull back the edge of the tray like this, and I'm going to use my handy dandy, this is an old yogurt container, it's my soil holder, it's what I, you know, sprinkle the soil in the cells, it's also my waterer. So I fill it up with water, I bend back the edge of the tray, and I just fill up the tray from the bottom with water. I never water from the top, and that's a really good rule um, when you're planting seedlings because there's a thing called damping off that's a real problem with seedlings, and I've had this problem before as well. And it happens when the seedling is too wet. Um, a lot of foil, uh, soil borne organisms, a lot of fungi, different things grow, and they literally rot the, the stem of that brand new little seedling right at the soil level, and it falls over and it's dead, and it makes you really sad because there's nothing you can do about it. Um, so, you want to make sure that that soil is not too damp, so I'd never water from the top. That also can wash your seeds out if you water from the top. So just pull the edge of that tray over, dump the water in the bottom, and don't add any if there's already water in there. You don't want standing water, so let it go a couple days between that watering. Now warm, this is something you do need to do. The reason that we plant in May in Utah for a lot of the seeds is that seeds germinate best at a temperature of about 80 degrees. So we wait for that soil to warm up. Now that's not true for every seed. There's a lot of cold loving seeds that I plant much earlier than that. But most seeds do best at about 80 degrees. So this is a really inexpensive heat mat. Again, you can get these on Amazon. Somebody bought this for me as a gift. Um, and you plug it in and it keeps, it keeps your temperature at between 75 and 80 degrees. So you set this underneath your tray, you plug it in. The tray goes right on top of it like this. It's waterproof, nothing will electrocute when you do this. You set it right on top and what it does is it keeps that soil at 80 degrees. So it's just like you have plugged in sunshine all the time. You're at 80 degrees, even though it's certainly not 80 degrees outside right now. In fact, it's snowing outside right now. The other thing you want is you want some light. You can do it in a window, although you're gonna get real leggy plants that reach over towards that light. You can do it just regular in the, you know, in, in the regular sunshine in your home, but it's not gonna be as, it's not gonna grow as quickly or as well as it would if you added some supplemental lights. So if you can see, this is my very homemade version. Just some shelves I got at Home Depot. These are some salvaged lights, some salvaged old shop lights. I got some for free from people. And um, these lights, you can use either fluorescent or LED in them, and you should keep them about three to four inches above the height of the plant. So as you can see, I have some bungee cords here. I also have some, some uh, metal chain that are suspending it because I can raise and lower these as my plants grow. Because I'm gonna wanna start them real close to the plants, three, four inches above, but as the plants grow, I'm gonna wanna raise my light up. In fact, sometimes these shelves are too short. By the time it's time to plant my plants out, they're hitting into these lights. But you wanna make sure that you had a little bit of supplemental light. Now, do you, do you need to buy the expensive grow lights? You can if you want, but you don't have to. I don't have them. I just have 
cheap uh, fluorescent lights. I bought one daylight, uh, one warm light. I think I put one of each in each of these fixtures because they're a two light fixture and that's what I used to grow with. They're very, very inexpensive. Um, okay, when do you plant? So this is my organization. I'm a little bit of a, a, an organizer freak, but this isn't that much organization and anybody can do this. When I get all my seeds, they come in a wonderful package. I'm so excited to get all these seeds. And I go through and I sort them out by when they need to be planted. So this was my first bag. These we're gonna plant today. These are peppers because peppers take a long time to germinate. Now my next bag says March 15th, March 25th. These are peppers and tomatoes. Again, these are gonna be planted indoors. Then the next bag, March 15th, all of these are going outside. So these are all of the cold loving plants. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about that, but you can find lots of charts online on which ones go in, which ones go out, when can you plant them. These are all gonna go outside in the soil. Um, these are all the cold loving things, all of the greens, the, uh, not the beans, the greens, the peas, um, cauliflower, cucumbers, all of the brassicas, not cucumbers, cauliflower, broccoli, all of the brassicas are gonna go outside when it's cold still, and they'll do just fine. Now the next bag, April 6th, inside. These are my cucumbers, my squash, my melons. I'm gonna start them inside, but they grow so quickly inside that if I planted them now, they would be huge by the time it was warm enough to put them outside in the garden. So they're not gonna get planted inside until April 6th because they only take about four weeks to grow inside my house. And then my last bag is May 12th and May 27th. These are the things that are gonna get planted directly in the soil outside once all the frost is done. So this probably took me maybe an hour but it's gonna save me a ton of time going through all of my seeds and sifting through when should I plant them, when should I do this, what should I do. Now I just put on my calendar March 15th, March 25th, and I know exactly what's gonna happen during those dates. Now, what are you gonna plant? So right now, today I'm planting peppers and I'm planting some cold loving things. Now I do another one little organization thing. So this is a cabbage, this one is a cold loving plant. So what it means is I'm going to be planting it indoors today, but I'm going to be able to put it outside in April, late March, even early April, by the time it's big enough to put outside. So I color coat things. So my peppers are pink. Get it? P and P. Um, everything that's cold loving is going to be in yellow for me. There's no rhyme or reason to this. It's just what I do. And then anything that I plant today that actually is not going to go out in the garden until it's warm is gonna be in green. So it's just an easy visual reminder as I'm looking at things to go, okay, I need to pull everything that's green off to the side, we're not going out yet, anything yellow, we're gonna go out probably the first of April. So those are just some things to know. So I hope as I've talked through this, the overriding thing that you've come away with is that this is doable. These, these are simple supplies. These are inexpensive techniques. Nothing's very fancy. The one thing that I do want you to be careful with though is that you do need to pay attention to these. You do need to actually know that they're growing. You don't have to do a lot, but you do need to know they're growing. This is a really great tool that's just a little timer. So I have all of my grow lights plugged into this surge protector and then this is a timer. These plants need about 16 to 18 hours of light a day. However, they do need to sleep. So the lights go off on this timer for six to eight hours a night. It gives them a little chance to sleep. Now I don't have to come down to my basement and turn them off every day because that timer will do it. It'll also turn it back on in the morning. I do keep them in my basement because they actually grow better and hardier if they're at about 60 degrees for growing. So they germinate at 80 degrees. Once those plants are up and once I see a couple little leaves, they go, come off of those germinating mats and they go over here onto these shelves, under the grow lights. Obviously the grow lights warm it up a bit, but uh, it's not real warm down here in my basement. But those grow lights are gonna keep those plants growing and they're gonna grow slowly, which gives a very hardy plant. A nice thick stem, a plant that's gonna be able to do well when it goes outside. Now that's the next thing you need to know. What do you do when you take these plants outside? You need to do what's called um, hardening off. So what I do is I put them right out here on my back deck uh, for about five days, I take them out, and sometimes I'll bring them back in at night if it's too chilly, but I'll take them out, I'll let them hang out there all day long. It's not real windy, it doesn't have direct sun most of the day, so it's just a chance for them to get outside and get used to the elements before we're just throwing them out in the garden. Because I've, in the past, gone to nurseries, bought a tomato plant, go and throw it out in the garden, it's like 85, 90 degrees that day, and that thing just, you know, withers, it's so sad. Don't do that to your poor little plants. Let them ease their way into the outside world and then they'll do just fine when you plant them in the garden. 
So I hope you're excited about gardening like I am, and I hope that you give planting inside a try. It's not that hard. Give yourself some extra insurance by planting a couple seeds in each. Sometimes I'll replant. If I don't see things coming up in a week or two, I'll just plant them again. No big deal. There's a lot of seeds in these packets. The seeds are cheap. Plant them again, and by the time May rolls around, you're going to have a whole basement full of plants ready to go out and feed your family for the whole summer. I hope you enjoyed this today, and if you have comments and things you'd like to share with me, please do. Again, this is Mount Mahogany, Stake Self-Reliance, part of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and I'm so glad that I could share this with you today.